Welcome, guys. Very excited to have <laughs> this conversation today. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know, my name is Samantha Beningo. I am the CEO and founder of Mind Movement. And today I have asked these two wonderful people to join me to talk more about uh, our immune health. And obviously during this really bizarre and uh, you know, critical, critical time for our health, it's really important that we know what we can be doing to really make our immune systems strong, to keep ourselves really healthy. Uh, it's a very strange time because while we're being asked to do that, we're also being asked to stay inside, which end, end in the middle of spring, which is an unusual, <laughs> just a combination of variables is really unusual. And so um, I have brought on health professionals to talk with us about ways to, to do that. So why don't you guys just introduce yourselves and then um, we can go from there. Why don't we start with you, Martin, because I'm looking at you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, um, my name is Morten Jensen. Um, I'm a certified nutrition coach. Um, I uh, work with people one-on-one -on -one to um, help people uh, make uh, lifestyle changes and uh, changes to their eating habits um, to create a more balanced, um, you know, healthy system and uh better eating uh habits to create a healthier life amazing thank you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. miss sydney hi my hi. name is sydney green i'm a registered dietitian nutritionist I work with individuals and groups um primarily for nutrition counseling and coaching and I focus on working with individuals that are in recovery. So that can be recovery from um, substance use, recovery from eating disorders, mental health disorders, um, who isn't in recovery from something. Mm -hmm. um, and my approach is the combination of nutrition science while also bringing in mindfulness with food. Right. Thank you. So, right. Also, um, you know, a mindfulness professional. So, and everything that we do at Mind, at Mind Movement for people that don't know is sort of framed in the conversation of mindfulness. And so all of our professionals, uh, you know, Morton and Sydney included, are also aficionados, if you will, at understanding the role of mindfulness and how to incorporate that in everything we do. So, on this conversation of immune health, we have created on our website 30 day challenges. And the idea there was immediately, as I've said many times, we all saw the opportunity in being forced to stay home. So right away, it, there was two things that came up for me. One was the level of stress that people were about to endure you know, immediately from the overwhelming reality of what was happening and just the surreal nature of all of this um, and all of the areas of our lives that it affects. And, and then the reality that we all have this opportunity to stay at home. And that is a really rare opportunity. Uh, it's, it's strange and it's rare. And so it immediately, you know, sounded like the perfect platform to start to try to find ways to help get information to people who are looking to make changes, who want to manage their stress while they're stuck at home. And that's exactly what our areas of expertise are really suited for best. So we turned our attention to creating these 30 day challenges. We also understand the competitive nature of human beings. And so we felt like to add some motivation into the equation, uh, sort of framing it as a challenge would be a helpful way to, you know, to increase our motivation and to get us to look at it. So I had asked all of you to support this, this idea and you guys came up with these amazing, you know, challenges. So, you know, one of the things that I, I just want to kind of get some information or feedback from you guys on before we take a look at them or at the nutrition one specifically is this idea of changing my lifestyle. So in order for this to work, we know that crash dieting is not going to be the strategy that, that you know, pays off in the end. 
by now, many of us have tried all of those and know that they are huge fails time and time again. And so if I want to make this really big overhaul to my diet because of its, you know, the, the amazing benefits all around, how do I do that in a way that is not just going to be like an all or nothing approach and going to last, that's going to stand the test of time. So why don't we, I'll start with you, Sydney, and then we'll just go around. Yeah. Um, it's like the million dollar question. I would <laughs> say that when somebody comes to me to work with me, by the time that they've sat down in front of me, they've tried every diet under the sun. They've read every book, done every cleanse, like all of it. Mm -hmm. And so actually it's all this knowledge and information that's out there that can affect our success in you know, long-term sustainable change. So usually first and foremost, I think dumping out all of the promises, all of the quick fixes, all mm -hmm. of the information out there, because what's most important for sustainable change is that we're all individuals and what works for me might not work for you, Sam, might not work for Morton. And so we can't expect that one plan or one approach is going to work for everybody. Mm. Um, and by the way, like the issue with that, right? When I say that is we all are shaking our heads and we get it, but it's not sexy. There's no like promise mm. in that. There's no like quick fix. Mm. It means that we're going to need some exploration. We're going to need practice, fail, try again. And that's not going to happen in 10 days. That's mm -hmm. going to happen over a long period of time. So um, that might start and we'll get into this. But like usually when somebody sits down for me and they leave, they're like, okay, what's my plan going to be? And it might be just starting with, let's have you drink a glass of water first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. And when you start winning one thing, that gives you the confidence to then go on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so you kind of get out of this cycle of failing, but I'll, I'll pause it there and, and <laughs> pass to Morton. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Sydney. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what you got to realize is that making even the smallest change, um, any change, whether it's nutrition or anything else in your life, is it, you know, it's difficult at best. And so if you want to make <laughs> big lifestyle changes, it, it's going to be hard work. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not something you just do overnight. Um, so taking it slowly um, from the very beginning and just, um, you know, just taking a breather and just going mm -hmm. all the way down and just starting from there. Like Sydney was saying, uh, mm -hmm. it could be as simple as starting with a glass of water in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. or any, you know, any small thing like that. Um, mm -hmm. and then, um, you know, building on that very, very slowly. The first thing, so, so when I, my clients, um, stay with me for, um, a year, um, mm -hmm. at a minimum and hopefully longer because, you know, it, 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 it just takes a long time. And. Um, mm -hmm. what I usually do with my clients is, um, you know, they get this one habit and then, um, that's something that they practice over a period of time mm -hmm. until that habit sticks with them. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you start working on the next part, um, and building slowly up until you have, you know, a foundation of, mm -hmm. of, of habits that you, um, that stick with you even after you start working with me. Um, mm -hmm. because that's the, you know, that's the point. Like if you do a diet in whatever, six week diet, um, you know, you change what you're doing for six weeks, weeks. Um, you may be restricting yourself, uh, mm -hmm. over that time. You're not really having fun with it. Um, mm -hmm. because, uh, your body is like screaming for all these things that it's used to getting. And then mm -hmm. suddenly after six weeks, you may have had seen some change in your body, but then what are you going to do after those six weeks? You're gonna go back to your old habits because you haven't really built any foundation in. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, think, I think what what's yeah. really great about what Morton said and what came up. Sydney, why can't we hear you? 
Can Hold you hear on. me now? There I you can. Go. <laughs> okay, sorry. So what is coming up for me um, as Martin was speaking and just like thinking about what we do at Mind Movement is before you even say that you're going to have the cup of water in the morning, tuning in, which no diet asks you to do, every diet assumes that you want to lose weight maybe, or like stop pain in your body, or like assumes that there's a tangible problem to fix that will have like a clear objective outcome. Mm -hmm. And we know that motivation is key and what people value is the heart of any sustainable change. So tuning in first to, okay, is it really weight loss? that I'm doing this for, or maybe it's, I want to feel confident in my body. And so what would that look like? Mm -hmm. Because then you're no longer held captive to like, well, if the number didn't change today, then Mm -hmm. screw it. Right. It's so it's (laughs) getting really clear about why you want to make this change with your diet. Mm -hmm. And what I find with people is that sometimes it starts out with weight loss because that's an easy like objective measure Mm -hmm. um but then what it really comes down to is i want to know how to make a decision on a menu and feel confident about that Mm -hmm. or like i want my confidence back with food Mm -hmm. um and so it's a little more nebulous than the objective Mm -hmm. value right yeah Well, okay, so there's so much to unpack here. Um, I don't even know where to start, kind of. But so you, you, you backed it up for us, Sydney, you started talking about motivation. You know, Morton made a lot of really important points about the process of change. So you're right, it's not sexy. Change is not sexy, and it's not comfortable. And if what you want is change in any area of your life, What change means at the level of the reality of the human experience is incorporating new learning over time such that it becomes automatic. That's what change means. It means that we have at the neurological level created new wiring that did not exist before because we did something so much that it became part of of us, literally physically part of us. That's what change is. Most people are not even aware that they have habits. They're not even aware that their thoughts and behaviors, by the time you're 35, about 95% of everything you do and every thought you have is automatic. It is a habit. It's a reaction that you've established over your lifetime. It is not a deliberate and conscious action or thought. And so, it's certainly when it comes to food is a very obvious place where we can even look. And if we take a look at all, we can see our habits, right? For example, I don't eat enough during the day because I'm so freaking busy. And so when, when I get hungry, it's at night. It's when I start to actually, my parasympathetic nervous system starts to activate enough for me to actually feel hunger. So, so habit, that's a habit. And it's a habit that as a workaholic, I've established over a long period of time, right? But if I don't stop and take a look at that, then I don't know that that's a habit, number one. I don't know that I have habits, number two. So when I go to change them, I don't even know that it's going to be excruciating because it is so not a part of my, my body and mind yet. And when So the simplest way to describe what change is, change is stepping into the moment that you're in right here and right now and making a different decision than you've ever made before. That's what it means. At the smallest particle, that is what change means. So to put it very, you know, in a very clear term, if we're trying to stop drinking, what it means is, You know, it's five o'clock. I usually have that after work drink, a cocktail. Maybe it's six o'clock, seven o'clock. I'm winding down. And at that moment, 6.58 rolls around and I usually have it at seven, right? I give myself, I'm not going to have it until 7 p.m. So I see the clock. It says 7 p.m. That's when the body starts to say, all right, you know, time to go. You know, what am I going to do? So, but it's in that moment, we can make to-do lists. We can commit to things, you know, in advance. Oh, I'm going to make this change and that change like the new year's resolution idea. But then when it all 
comes down, you know, to brass tacks in that moment, it's about making a different decision than I've ever made before. Seven o'clock hits. I don't get up and get the drink. Don't make myself the drink. I take the alcohol out of the house. You know, that is a huge, and I don't go buy another bottle. Uh, <laughs> big freaking decision. Very hard one to make. I mean, change is the hardest thing there is. That's why most people aren't going to do it because it's really hard. And as you guys pointed out, motivation is the critical variable because it's going to be hard. It's going to be painful. So I love, Sydney, that you mentioned that the first thing has got to be accessing what really matters to you because without that, we're not going anywhere, right? But then the other piece that you mentioned, this is where things get so tricky with nutrition. You said it's individual. Mm -hmm. So how the hell do I know what to do? Because it's individual. So where do I even start if what I'm supposed to do is different for me than other people? How about that? <laughs> I don't, Martin, do you want to take that one first? Sydney, whoever, <laughs> jump in somebody. Somebody. Um, yeah, I can start. Um, well, you said it yourself earlier. You, it's about creating awareness, um, right? Um, and that, that comes down to bringing mindfulness into your eating. Um, and that's why some of the challenges that we have um, on our page is, in, includes things like slowing down and, mm. you know, avoiding all, all distractions and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. to help you uh, begin to listen a little bit to your body because, you know, it is individual. Every single person out there is unique in some way and um, your body will react. You know, the body reacts to anything you put into it. So anything you consume has some sort of reaction um, mm -hmm. in your body. And... Um, figuring out what that reaction is to um, whatever mm -hmm. food you eat is so important. And every single food is different to every single person. So um, the first thing you got to do is just create awareness around what you eat. So that, but that also includes like bringing awareness to how you eat. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's eating slowly. That's not having distractions. That's not doing everything else. Um, mm -hmm when you're actually eating like most people are doing these days including myself sometimes <laughs> I mean, the other day the other day i was having a con conversation in the kitchen with gordon standing up while we were eating both of us and we were like running from one thing to the next and we just had a break so you know it's it's difficult for everyone um even when you have the knowledge but um yeah but creating awareness is key mm -hmm. yep thank you yeah sydney So yeah, oh. I can't hear again. Sid? <laughs> Where is she? Is she there? Can't She's hear? muted. All right, there. Wait, hold on. There, there you go. go. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so starting with awareness 100%. And then I think, as I said before, it's a little bit of trial and error, and it's a practice. So what we're told... Um, I'll just take something that's super common I see all the time. Let's take weight loss that someone really wants to lose weight. So most people, when they come to see me, they say, I've cut out carbs before and I've lost a ton of weight. Mm -hmm. But then I start eating them again and I gain the weight back and then some. Okay. So collectively, that's assuming that bread or carbohydrates are bad for us mm -hmm. as a whole. But where it comes down to the individual is, well, some people might actually need carbohydrates in their day in order to keep them on track with that weight loss goal. Mm -hmm. And those carbs can come from different places and we have to figure out what's best for you. Whereas somebody else might be highly sensitive to carbohydrates. And so if they eat a sandwich that might, their body might process it differently and or it might initiate a craving for more carbs later on. So that's going to affect their goal mm. um, in a negative way. So when it comes to the individualization, it's, okay, first, what's your overall goal? What's the motivation? Let's look at 
what you've been eating mm. and then like where can we play around with this is where nutrition science comes in is like okay we know these things can affect weight let's play around and see how your body reacts to keeping them in or taking them out and so the with the 30-day challenge i think one day was like try avoiding bread mm -hmm. some people they might try that and be like oh this worked out so great for me and mm -hmm. i actually feel fine and my body feels really good after and maybe somebody else that's tried it might be like well now i'm obsessing about bread right all day long and that's great it's not a, a success or a failure now you have information to work with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly and that's why um you know every single day in the 30-day challenge that's something new because some yeah. you know one yeah. thing will work for one person and and not for the next and it's it's about finding that thing that works for you mm -hmm. and also just um adding a sense of um excitement and you know um just like curiosity and adventure and trying new things um mm -hmm. that you're not used to um because it, 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 you've got to make it fun at the same time because otherwise you don't want health and food to be a drag and mm -hmm. a chore and something that you don't enjoy because then mm -hmm. it's just not gonna be it's just not gonna work Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I noticed even for me, so, um, and you know, doing the 30 day challenge and going grocery shopping, uh, really staying right on the periphery, um, you know, produce, the uh, fresh meats, um, really trying to stay, you know, out of the middle section and staying away from the process. But there are certain things that I, you know, I've just gotten in the habit of buying and, I have been more conscious of the labels as a result of starting the challenge. And I'm like, oh my God, I thought this was one thing. And now I realize that it's not what I thought. Uh, and so the other thing about the challenge that's been so helpful is it's drawing my awareness to things that I may not even, you know, they wouldn't even come on my radar about both my behavior, but also about you know, these different things that I don't think much about that are also having a dramatic impact on, like you're saying, food cravings, how my body, you know, operates, what maybe is the best thing for me and what's probably not the best thing for me. So the other thing is just trying it has been really eye-opening and really informative and I've learned so much. So it's been fun just to learn so much from you guys too. Yeah. Good, I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's that too. I think that's the part where classic diets fail is you're mm. told it's prescriptive. It's eat this, not that, eat at this time, not at that time for an extended period of time. So the word of a challenge, right, automatically brings in more fun and that it's short it's doable. Anybody can try one thing out for one day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Versus, and to your point, Sam, like if you're doing, if you, if challenge accepted, then that means you're going to start exploring versus, well, this diet told me I can't have X, Y, and Z. And that might, it promised me this thing. So I'll just take it and buy it. And like, mm -hmm. I won't even look into it. Right, so it takes out the exploration, the curiosity, which is part of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. so you're not really learning anything from the most conventional diets. Mm -hmm. Well, and the other thing that I've noticed that is mindfulness centric as well is the non-judgment. So, you know, cause the other thing I think we're so critical of ourselves when it comes to this topic, yeah. you know, we, we've learned the good and bad philosophy of food cake is bad, you know, broccoli is good, you know, things that are good taste bad, right? I mean, like sugar tastes good, but we're not supposed to have that. And all of that also is such an integral part of how we think about food, how we interact with food, you know? Um, and so it also is, you know, really helpful in that way too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Were you going to say something, Martin? Did I cut you off? Go ahead. Uh, no, well, um, yeah, it's like if you, that's the same, it's going back to the, um, the um, you know, 
any sort of diet that's out there that people try. And it's like, if you tell someone not to do something or not to eat something, <laughs> that's going to be on their mind the whole time. Right. Um, yeah. So making it a challenge is mm -hmm. a short challenge is certainly um, uh, more interesting and more fun. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I had another point and I've forgotten for a second. Well, <laughs> also in the mindfulness part of that challenge. So it's like the bringing the non-judgmental curious spirit to the, to the whole process, because when I am very self-critical and when I am, you know, Oh my God, I, I failed or, Oh my God, you know, uh, then I, what do I do? Like you're saying, I, it's all or nothing. Mm -hmm. So instead of, you know, um, if I'm doing kind of like, I'm going to change my entire diet tomorrow, then three days later I eat cake or a cookie. Then the next day I'm like, all right, I failed at this anyway, screw it. And I just go right back to what I was doing before. So one of the things I also love about the, the challenge that it has that mindfulness component, it is about curiosity. It is one trying one new thing a day, very, very basic. It's designed to slow us down, as we've talked about, to reflect on our behavior, reflect on how we feel in relationship to what we're doing. But it's also, you know, um, a very different approach and one that's designed to last more than four days, you know, on one of these like crash diet experiences, mm -hmm. which is the key. So it's not sexy as you started out saying, but it's the key. It's the key to sustainable change. So if you're going to make change, this is, there's no other real way to do it. Uh -huh. And it's also way more empowering to do it that way than it is to do like a prescriptive diet where you're told exactly what to do. Because when someone then stops telling you what to do, um, you know, you don't have that, the power to do it yourself anymore. Wow. You've lost that power. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And Sydney, as you pointed out, there's also power in winning, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. because the failure that we've, the word diet by itself is like associated with failure. You know, it's associated with an unpleasant experience, one that is going to probably fail, one that is short term, because when I hear I'm going on a diet, what does that mean? It means I'm doing something for a short period of time and then it's going to be over someday. So <laughs> I don't know anyone that's ever succeeded going on a diet, not a single person. In fact, the people that I know that diet, diet their entire lives. So they're, they spend their entire lives doing this, you know, uh, 60 days on a crash diet where they're not eating and they're restricting and they're obsessed with food the entire time. Then they binge and eat whatever they want for like three or four weeks. Then they go back on the diet. And this is the way that they live their entire lives eating a low fat, <laughs> a low fat, like tastes like crab filled with all kinds of chemicals <laughs> diet. I mean, it's horrible. It's horrible. It's a horrible way to live. Right. And not the irony the, is, what'd you say? Sorry, not to mention the hormonal imbalance that it is going to create at yeah, the same time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the joint pain and the, I mean, the all kinds of other things that it's causing, right? The level of just criti criticism, self-criticism like mm. that that's causing. It's fine, honey, one year. And yeah. I think it, and it goes back to the beginning, right? Of like, what's the motivation if you're constantly on that, like diet too implies that there's something that we need to fix, that what we're doing isn't right. And that like, we're wrong and we don't know what we're doing. And so taking a single challenge, succeeding at it, like, it's empowering. It changes our headspace around food, which we constantly are like, is this right? Do you think this is what I should be eating? Is this okay? Mm -hmm. Then if we wake up in the morning, we have a glass of water, like, oh, I did that. And that wasn't so bad. What else can I do? And I think a really interesting example is I have somebody I'm working with um, and I recommend anybody um, journal their food. And this person eats very nutritiously, you know, lots of vegetables, lean protein, nuts, like colorful plates. And her portions are great, you know, and 
and I asked her how she was doing and how she was feeling. And she was like, I think I'm okay. You know, I think I need to work on portions though. And a little more prompting was, why do you think that? Are you feeling really full when you're done eating? Are you still hungry? And she's like, no, I feel okay. Like, so why do you think portions? And she's like, well, I just assume that what I'm doing must not be okay. Like I must need some help with it. Hmm. And so, you know, it just goes to show that like, we constantly assume that we need to fix, fix, fix. And there's no trust that's ever built. But, you know, by winning small things over and over, you start to trust yourself again and your body again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you've mentioned a few times people feeling a lot of self-doubt. And at Mind Movement, we talk about self-doubt constantly. We talk about it as self-invalidation. But most people, because they've gotten into a habit of deferring to the right answer for their entire lives, it's a... You know, we think that if we defer to the right answer, the right answer about what to study in college, the right answer about where to live, the right answer about, you know, every little detail of our lives, what weight to be at, how to look, who to hang out with. If we, if we default to that, then we won't lose. So I call it like the playing, you know, not to lose. We're playing, right? It's not to win. It's just not to lose. And in doing that, essentially what we do is we forego our ability to hear our inner voice. So we don't realize that there is no right answer. There's only the right answer for me. And that's really the reality, right? Most people don't know that we actually don't even share the reality that we think we do. Mm -hmm. Reality is perception and perception is very specific to each of us. And so we're really given a lot of bad and false information from the get-go about this idea of truth and about this idea that, you know, um, there's a right answer, I have to find it and then live my life according to that. What ends up happening as your client, I'm sure knows, and as many of our clients and associates and friends and uh, find out, when you try to live deferring to the right answer, you wind up with a lot of, you know, self-doubt, indecision, and, you know, and feeling like constantly unfulfilled, doing that problem scanning all the time, waking up, searching for the problem, where's the problem, where's the problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and being in a low level of anxiety and unhappiness most of the time, right? So, yeah. Yeah, and you, you even start to look, um, you, you also start to look elsewhere and you start to look online and trying to figure out what's the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, and there is so much information on the internet mm -hmm. and on social media and everywhere that you can find that will tell you different things. Mm -hmm. And most of it is BS, <laughs> to be frank. Um, and it's really unfortunate because a lot of it looks really genuine, um, you know, genuine and it looks, uh, it looks right. It looks, and you know, it's done in a really, fancy way so that it looks like okay these people must must know what they're talking about right. and they're telling you like you have people telling you you have to stop eating these foods because it creates all these diseases and things like that but like we were saying before it's individual yes it might affect one person in a really bad way mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean it affect me the same way mm -hmm. so you know just cutting something out of your diet because someone tells you to it's not, you know, that's not the right way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. Equally, it's the it's same thing the other way. way, you know. I might tell you you should eat this, but that doesn't necessarily help you. Mm. Yeah. And then also there's the reality that what matters most is what people are going to do. So you can give me all the great information in the world. It can be even specifically tailored to me. But if I'm not going to do it because I just don't have the motivation, then it's not practical anyway. It's totally useless to me. If anything, I'm going to use it to say I should be doing this, but I'm not. So I'm going to beat the crap out of myself for not doing it. So, you know, the other thing that we always talk about is the practicality of something. You know, um, what, is, what is accessible to me? And that's the other reason why I think the challenge was designed in a really smart way because like you said, anybody can do anything one, one time one for one day and you can decide, is this thing realistic? Am I realistically going to give up caffeine? 
Because I can tell you right now, the answer is no. And by like noon on that day, it was not even was like 1140. I was like, okay, I have no desire to give up caffeine. I have no desire to win that badly. <laughs> right? So I'm not going to do that. Um, maybe someday, someday I might be willing to do that. Just not, just not now. Um, but you know, but okay, I was willing to give it a shot and I know myself well enough to know, okay, that's not going to be, that's not the point of entry probably for me, but water, like you said, sending water when I wake up, that's doable. Like, you know, so, you know, I think that's the other part. We get to see what's practical and what we actually will do because can and will huge distinction. And oftentimes as uh, clinical professionals, as mental health professionals, we're asked to assess motivation on those terms. Is this that somebody can do something and they're not, or that they can't do it? Mm -hmm. And I would say 99% of the time, it's not about whether somebody can do something. It's about whether they will. And those mm -hmm. are very different things. <laughs> totally. Mm -hmm. and, I, and also I mean, based so on... on you're turned way down and I can't hear you. Go ahead. <laughs> and also based on... Um, where you're at in life like it's constantly changing so here we are in yeah. physical distancing isolation mm -hmm. and i'm not willing to give up certain things right now but when i'm on the other side of this perhaps maybe and so i'm with you on the caffeine like <laughs> i was just like no, not the time for me today, <laughs> but um, maybe when I'm more stimulated with the outside world, yeah. when I get out of the house, I'll do that. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it, it constantly changes and evolves with where you're at in time and space. Mm -hmm. No question about it. Yeah. No, no question about it. And right now I noticed for me, so, and this has really been interesting. I mean, this is what the value of this experience is. You have a natural introspection opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's forced. I don't, I don't, I don't even have to think about it. I'm just watching myself because I have no other place to look. Right. So, but the great thing about that, I noticed that I've been cooking every single night just naturally like going into the kitchen at five o'clock and like cooking a meal. And it's like, wow, this is so great. I love doing this. I love mm -hmm. it. My daughter loves it. This is fantastic. Why don't I do this again? Why aren't I doing this? I don't do this. I never do this. Why don't I doing this? And so, you know, that has been by itself, a, you know, a life changing realization. The other thing is I'm like, oh, I suck at it. I suck at cooking. So that's why I don't do it. I, suck. I don't like it. I'm not good at it. Well, that's not true at all. It's just that I don't take the time to put the effort in to actually even try to be good at it. So that's another piece to all of this. Like there is this opportunity to assess what the truth is about who we are and what we value and what we're willing to try and what we're willing to do, what we're willing to eat, what we're, you know, I mean, I think, our day-to-day -day lives, we get into very strict habits. Mm -hmm. We really do, right? I mean, mm -hmm. especially here in New York City, there's time is the big commodity for everybody. But certainly in New York, we're all these crazy overachievers who are grinding it out day after day, trying to fit as much in the allotted time in the 24 hours that we can, right? And at the same time, you know, trying to also take care of ourselves. And so we can get into these horrible habits because the goal is not take care of myself first, right? The goal is grind it out, get what I want. And hopefully I do the best I can take care of myself in that equation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Later someday when I get to the place where I, you know, I'm sitting back and right, whatever, sipping your virgin margarita on a beach somewhere, <laughs> whatever it is, right? Um, yeah, someday that's what I'll do. Unfortunately, that's not how the human experience works. We develop habits, the habits stay with us because of the way that our brain and body are always looking to make things efficient. So then change becomes not only difficult, it can become impossible. Mm. And so having, again, this, this moment 
to actually <laughs> reflect on the truth about who we are, what we value, how we take care of ourselves, and using the time to start to challenge those things, challenge the things we think we know and what we can and can't do and are willing to do. This is, I mean, there's never gonna be a better time and we're forced to do that right now. This is, may never happen again. <laughs> and it's true. Let's hope it never happens again. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't ever wanna go through this again, <laughs> but because we have to, Right? Um, why not use it in, in, to the best, in the best way possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's, there's so much you can learn from this. Um, you know, our challenge, but also just that you can learn about yourself uh, mm -hmm. in so many different ways. And you may discover those things that, that you don't like about yourself, or you may discover mm -hmm. those things that you love about yourself. You've probably discovered some, you know, some from each camp. Um, mm -hmm. But um, like I'm the same. I, I'm. I've actually been. I cook a lot generally, but I've been cooking so much more than I do uh, mm -hmm. than I regularly do, and um, it's been a lot of fun. And like you were saying before, a lot of people think they don't know how to cook. But you don't have to become a master chef to, um, you know, to cook healthy food at home no, to make yeah. it even taste good. There's, yeah. there's, there's simple ways to do it. And, um, and I think some of the upcoming challenges actually help you to, um, to explore that a bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Such an interesting, just to stay on the cooking topic for a second. Mm -hmm. I I'm always in my kitchen. I pretty much have seen the team meetings, but like I pretty much only eat food that I've made myself, mm -hmm. except for like occasionally on the weekends, um, because I tell myself that I really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. What I'm learning now, I'm like, if I have to put oil in a pan one more time and chop the stuff and like saute it and like mm -hmm. like i'm gonna lose it mm -hmm. right i'm actually <laughs> so done with cooking and mm -hmm. food and recipes and like <laughs> that it's been really interesting to notice how i really value certain tastes and certain things that food gives my body and how it makes me feel but maybe that connection to food itself and the cooking aspect mm. when i cook at home it's really that break like that i don't get because i'm constantly grinding it out and now mm. that i have so much other break time mm. i don't really need this space and i wish my partner actually knew how to cook so i could still get the outcome without like having to chop and do the wow. stuff again. So it's been, it's been powerful. And I think, mm -hmm. um, I think you can learn so much from cooking and maybe we do another thing just about cooking, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's been fascinating. The things you tell yourself you really need or want or like, and then to watch it. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, that's really profound. We're bringing, um, I think next week we're going to be bringing on Jeremy Smith, who's the head chef at Kripalu to do some cooking with us too. Um, Jeremy's actually a dear friend, but one of the most amazing chefs I've started this guy, one of the most amazing chefs I have ever, uh, been near or had the opportunity to, um, taste the food for. So he's an incredible guy. Hopefully you guys get a chance to, to, you know, trade ideas um but i imagine that's true because the more time you spend cooking the more it becomes i would think a job something you have to do totally. versus something that you do because you love it right <laughs> but but it's a great what a great um realization yeah I don't like doing this <laughs> yeah i'm like done. Yeah. yeah that's profound Totally. Really. <laughs> yeah, I love that you said that, Sydney, because it again it kind of shows how we're all different and how, you know, someone who cooks all the time suddenly just had enough. And mm -hmm. 
Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, it also shows, so one other realization. So, you know, obviously we offer fitness classes every day and we're trying to figure out what the best times are to offer these so that people will use them and they're free. So we're just really trying to get resources in the hands of as many people as possible. So we're trying to plan this out, but all the data that we have is according to life before COVID-19. So there's no map for this. Like, no, we don't know. What are people's behaviors like? Well, you know, so it turns out that, you know, when people are given the opportunity or the choice to exercise at any time they can or want to, they don't want to exercise after 5 p.m. That the majority of us are not, it appears, exercising between, I would say, 6 and 9, even though when I, on a normal Tuesday in New York City, I can't get into a class if I don't book ahead of time between those hours. Between 5 and 9, you cannot get a class, yoga class in New York City during that time. So it's really amazing how oh, so I guess we're not doing that because we love exercise at 7 p.m. We're doing it because we have no other time to do it in the day. Mm. Wow, isn't that interesting? So it's like when we're given more time, oh, we sleep a little later. That's interesting. I don't love getting up at 6.30 or 7 every, day, every <laughs> single day. Uh, so it's, it's, really, it's really, I think, pretty interesting to watch how our behavior has changed so dramatically when our desire becomes the front and center and not I have to because of some mm. external variable that we don't even know it's there. So true. So In interesting. In such a short period of time as well. It, I mean, it's only what, is it three or four weeks ago we were out. Yeah, not even three full weeks, right? It'll be three, four right. weeks on Monday. Yeah? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. Um, well, so certainly if anybody has any questions, feel free, you can, um, chat them to us. You can email them to us after this info at mindmovement.com. Um, you know, I think this immunity, the other thing that I just want to mention, um, before we wrap this up, the thing at mind movement that is, you know, the big learning curve or the big point that I think is so important to always mention we understand that taking care of our body in, includes exercise, rest, although not as much as we probably should. Um, Justin and I were just talking before this that uh, sleep is like, if you're into sports and uh, performance coaching, sleep is like number one, the most important thing of all. And that's probably the thing I prioritize last, but um, right, whatever we know. So, <laughs> but we, we know like, okay, yeah. So how I treat my body, exercise, rest, food, we know that part. What we don't know is that thoughts, how we think, what we think about, the direction of our thinking. If thoughts, if we're focusing on things uh, in a habitual way that are making us angry, sad, scared, those are things that are also affecting the physical form, literally like you're playing the piano of toxic chemical reactions versus flooding the nervous system with positive feel good like um you know it's like in the legend of zelda there were like little hearts that would indicate that you have more life right and you could <laughs> earn hearts as you went through the game i feel like in this way hearts are like thinking positively you get more hearts <laughs> in the game if you're affirmative if you're positive if you're loving Right. And of course, that even sounds cheesy when it's coming out of my mouth because of old habits. You know, the old me would have rolled my eyes before that sentence was even out of my mouth. So I think we're just we're very much trained to be negative, to be jaded. You know, New Yorkers were the jaded New Yorkers. The challenge, though, is understanding that you're poisoning your body. Mm -hmm. Literally not. I'm not being metaphorical. You are literally dumping poison into the body by over focusing on the negative the fear uh and you know people will say but sam are you telling me that i shouldn't have feelings absolutely not i'm telling you to acknowledge your feelings and i'm also telling you that if you are stuck in a habit of negative thought and emotion that is something that you are you need to address immediately because that by itself can is more poisonous than any piece of candy that you could possibly put inside your body uh, so, <laughs> and it's just always, I think, a helpful thing to mention, right? Um, Absolutely. And it does, it connects with the whole um, 
changing lifestyles and changing the way you eat because if you if you don't change your mindset as well as you know once you're once you've lost the weight you want to lose or you've you've achieved what you wanted to achieve if you still think of yourself as a terrible person mm -hmm. or you have all these negative thoughts mm -hmm. then you're still that same person and you're eventually going to go back to mm. what you used to be. Or you're going to be miserable anyway. I mean, yeah. right. Cause I think the other thing is we tend to think that, Oh, well, if I just could be skinny, then I could, then I'll be happy. When I lose mm. 10 pounds, then I'll be happy. When I am exercising every day, then I'll be happy. Everybody tells me I'll feel better when I exercise all that. Okay. But the truth is that physical action and circumstantial changing is never going to change the inner game. It's never going to change the inner. That that's the big like victim mentality. The victim mentality meaning that we think that the circumstances of our lives are what has to change to make us happy, but that then always keeps us stuck in feeling like we're victimized. Because if I need Sydney to walk at a different pace in front of me <laughs> on the street for me to be happy, I'm going to be pissed off all the damn time because <laughs> there's a lot of people that aren't going to walk at the pace that I want them to, especially here in New York city with 9 million people around. So, um, yeah, so these are right. These are, <laughs> that's an important piece to keep, to keep front and center. You can lose all the weight in the world, but still be a very miserable human being. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for, for being a part of this conversation. It's such a pleasure. I have learned so much from you guys in the last couple of weeks. I cannot tell you. The challenge has taught me so much. Having these roundtable discussions, I mean, it's changing everything about the way I shop, everything about the way I like pause before I, I step into the kitchen and I'm pausing. You guys would be so proud of the refrigerator right now. It is beautiful. It has so many different colors and healthy <laughs> options. <laughs> so, you know, and it's, it's happened organically. I'm not like forcing that on myself and I'm, you know, it's just sort of this natural byproduct of these conversations. And so I thank you so much. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. And have a lovely weekend, not like it's any different than today. And <laughs> we'll, we'll see each other next week soon, I guess. Uh, yeah, definitely. Thank you for having us again. Thanks, Thanks for guys. having us. Bye, Bye. everybody. Have a great Bye. day. Be safe.